say, Jesus, in your precious name we pray. Amen. Church, you may be seated. Good morning, Rock Church. Wonderful to see you this morning. If we haven't met, I am Pastor James, and uh, we're just excited that you've come to share worship with us today. Uh, Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew. So if you join me in Matthew chapter 18, I'm going to pick up, and it's verses 23 through 35. Now this is a story that Jesus, it's a parable, so it's a story that Jesus is telling to Peter, and because Peter has just asked him, is uh, how many times do I have to forgive my brother? And Jesus, you know, do I have to forgive him seven times? And Jesus says, no, 70 times seven. So anyway, Jesus goes on to talk about, tell him this parable. And so pick up with me, uh, if you can, in verse 23. He says, therefore, the kingdom, is, kingdom of heaven is like, and we've talked a lot of about this kingdom of heaven, right? So we're, we're going to draw upon that a little bit more today. The kingdom is, of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle the accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the, man ordered, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this point, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servants just as I had on you? In, his, in anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all that he owed. This is how my Father in heaven will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother and sister from your heart. We know, as Christ followers, that Jesus had, has a heart of compassion. And so we're starting a new sermon series talking about compassion, what compassion is, the the elements of compassion, how is it characterized. And so this is the first week we're going to talk about compassion. See, the word compassion in the New Testament, Jesus has a Greek word that, that was translated for us. It actually has two forms. You can, you would hear pity or you would hear compassion, but in both But in every part of the Gospels, anywhere Jesus spoke about compassion, compassion is a verb, okay? Compassion implies action. Now, in our modern world, we're drawn to some other terms that are often kind of confused with compassion, right? We we often hear the word empathy, Empathy is a word that is, is tossed around in our culture all the time right now. And empathy is, I've heard several definitions, but one of them is you, can, you literally can emotionally and intellectually stand in the place of another human being in a situation. So you can, you can see everything from their point of view and you, can, you understand their emotion and how they, re, how they would respond. And that's empathy, when you can step into somebody else's shoes and really truly understand them. And it's a close kindred to sympathy. Sympathy is you can feel for someone. You can have an emotion that, that is you feel for another person. Actually, empathy is a relatively new word, word in our, our concept, even in our language. It, it came about in the early 1900s 
in this sort of the development of psychology as psychology was becoming a bigger and bigger factor. That, and so it's actually even a new concept and word that we didn't really have before. We, we understood compassion and we understood sympathy, but empathy is actually a relatively new word. And it's a new idea. And often today in Christian circles and in, in areas that we may be involved, um, we, uh, we, under, we, we start participating to be more empathetic when in fact God's calling us to be compassion. See, empathy really ends with a feeling, right? There's, uh, there's nothing else that, that follows. So empathy and sympathy both are just, they're just nouns. They're describing a condition. So you can be empathetic to somebody once, you've, once you feel like you can stand in their shoes and understand their emotions and how they feel, and then you're done. Same with sympathy. It's just, it's a feeling or you can, you can feel for somebody, but that's really the end of it. They're both nouns. So it may feel like I'm, we're kind of splitting hairs over, over language, but the reality is, is that compassion, the way Jesus used the word in the, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, is always action. And so we see it here in the, in the scripture reading this morning. The king had compassion or pity, and then he canceled the debt. Okay, so that was, that's the same Greek word, compassion or pity, he canceled the debt. So we see about that, we, we see that there's a real difference between, between the two. So, uh, but we are being called in many cases that we should be empathetic and we should be, we should be putting ourselves in another shoe. For example, we just celebrated Monday, uh, Columbus Day. So we, for many years, we've celebrated uh, Columbus, Christopher Columbus, sailed the ocean blue in 1492, right? We, we, we've celebrated this for many, many years, and they celebrated in Spain because, as you know, uh, Columbus went to King Ferdinand to finance the trip. And so even in Spain, they celebrate Columbus Day because in one, in one sense, we actually, uh, we actually look at this as, hey, this, well, thank you, Kim. This is the uh, person who enabled us to have North America and kind of the, the, the continent as we know it today. This is, this is the beginning. But we're also called, and we're being drawn to this idea that it's also Indigenous Persons Day, where we celebrate the fact that there were people that were here already. And that in the end, they were actually the ones that were overrun by the, the European conquerors and, and that we should be empathetic to kind of their condition and their circumstance and what they've gone through. So we're, we're, we're basically being asked to look at the world through another person's shoes. Now, both of them are important, right? Both of them, the context of both of those is important and has value. And this is what I mean by empathy. It's, it's where we start participating or, or understanding our world through another person's shoes. So that's, that's just an example of what, what we're being called to look at. So uh, to be empathetic or sympathetic by another person's view. But often we confuse compassion or pity with this idea of empathy. But there's a couple of really important distinctions. The first one I just talked about, he says, empathy is actually, it's just passive. It's complete and you're done in the word. Whereas compassion is active. You had compassion and you took action. But the second difference that we see is that empathy, to be empathetic with someone, to another person, can often be us taking on an emotion or taking a viewpoint that may be actually sinful, okay? So for example, um, you, you have a friend. She's cheating on her husband because he's a dirty, rotten so-and-so. And you're like, man, I can see that. I don't like that guy either. He's terrible, right? And so, but you stepping into that emotion is you putting in your, yourself in a place that's also sinful. And so to, we need to be very judicious about how we uh, use our empathy, how we use those moments and these thoughts and emotions 
to process the world around us because we actually need to understand, like, is this a sinful emotion? Is this something that I don't need to be a part of, that I shouldn't be a part of? So there's a really big difference between being empathetic and compassion. And when we look at it, like, okay, these are, these are two separate things. First, it's active. Compassion is active. And second, it's, uh, we have to be careful that we don't step into sin. But that's not to say that Jesus didn't give us a lot of really, give us some examples of being empathetic. And the first one that comes to mind for me is in Mark. And we're going to jump there, Mark chapter 12 and verses 42 through 44. So this is, uh, this is just a one story about Jesus, and it's completely contained in this. But uh, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were being put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. See, in this parable, Jesus didn't change the circumstances for the woman. He drew his, his disciples' attention to see from her perspective what what it was like, right? To be able to draw their attention, to give them vision that, that of what, uh, what this widow was experiencing. And he didn't go and, and bless the woman and say, there's, you know, uh, 10,000 bags of gold uh, at your household. You're not going to be poor anymore. He didn't change her circumstance, but he did use that to help his disciples and to help us understand what empathy looks like. That if we put ourselves in her shoes, man, what a testimony it is that she didn't give out of her wealth. She didn't give, you know, she only had, it was all that she had even to live on and she gave it to God. That's an important thing that, that we see. So there's, there's, there's an, there are a few examples of Jesus being empathetic, but there's so many more examples of Jesus showing compassion. Matter of fact, this is one of the one one of the things that we see prolifically in the New Testament that Jesus had compassion, and by compassion, it was there was action. If we pick up, we, we saw this morning in Math in the Matthew 18, verse 27. See that the king had compassion, he canceled the debt. So even though it's a parable, I'm not trying to like help you with new theology somewhere. It's just a parable. Jesus was just telling a story. But he was telling this story so that he had, people understood this idea of compassion was followed by action, canceled the debt. And he, he used it specifically in this language reference to compassion. We can, always, we can also pick up in Matthew chapter 15. So 15 verse 32 Okay, Jesus calls his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They've already been with me for three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry or they may collapse along the way. This is the story, where, this is the part of the, of the New Testament where Jesus feeds the 4,000. So this isn't 4,000 men alone, it's 4,000 households. They'd been following Jesus and they'd heard him teaching for days and days and he had compassion on them because they hadn't eaten. So he was, before they were sending him, before he was sending them away, they, he fed them all so that they could make the journey home, right? Compassion is he was teaching, but he saw the need and he fed them. Okay, also in Mark chapter 9, Verse 22, this is where Jesus heals a boy possessed by an impure spirit. And Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered, it has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do, but if you can do anything, take pity, compassion, on us and help us. If you can, Jesus said. 
Everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And Jesus rebukes the spirit and and, uh, releases the boy. And so Jesus had compassion on the boy. So we see over and over in the New Testament where Jesus literally took the word or took it into Jesus had pity on them or he had compassion on them. And we see that he just saw the condition of the people themselves and did it, right? He didn't, we don't see anywhere in the New Testament that, that he got involved in their psychology, that he, he was trying to figure out uh, how did they feel about their situation. He wasn't trying to be empathetic. He wasn't just being sympathetic because he had compassion and he was acting. And in the New Testament, we see where Jesus has healed, he's delivered people, he taught them, one of them, one of the sayings is Jesus had compassion on them because they were like a sheep. They were like sheep without a shepherd. So he taught them. Uh, he did, uh, he delivered them. He delivered the, them from illness, from the demonic uh, possession. He, he did all these acts and he wasn't really that interested in understanding their viewpoint. He just saw the need and he stepped in to the need. And he saw their condition, and he's like, he had compassion by acting, by taking action on them. See, empathy is just helping us see what others see. Compassion is us acting it out. So for order, in order for us to be, as Christians, to be little Christ or followers of Christ, we too need to see the circumstances, see people's circumstances, and just act. We don't need to be analyzing everybody's particulars. We just need to see what's there, what's the need, and begin to act. See, I believe compassion comes from this viewpoint of authority or uh, strength. When God says, I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. It comes from a viewpoint of authority. They they can see it. God knows what it is. He, he has the authority. And he has the authority to do something about it. Same in the example with Christ. He's saying here, he had compassion on people because he saw the condition and he had the authority to do it. And I would say if we, if we take those two and just say, okay, they, it's clarity, right? They have, a, they have a, a, a view of clarity. And that's what as Christ followers... We need to have a view of clarity and objectivity. See, in our scripture reading this morning, you, it begins with, uh, Jesus begins the parable with, the kingdom of heaven is like, right? And, and through it, we've been talking about the kingdom of heaven. This is God's, God's desire for what the world should be like. We even, we even pray, God, your kingdom come, your will be done. So there's this, there's this, kingdom of heaven that, that God is, is desiring for us, this idea of perfection. And in this parable today, I think this is how we translate the idea of, of strength and authority and object, objectivity into action. I think first we recognize that the world that we live in is fallen. It's not God's plan for our world today. We're living in a world where there's war and suffering and pain. And even ourselves, we fall short of God's glory. Sometimes we're not even being very helpful in our compassion. So we live in a world that that is not the kingdom of God, right? there's, There's this world and plane that we live in That is not the kingdom of God. Second, I think we need to recognize that the object of our compassion or the the person or the people of our compassion are not experiencing the kingdom, right? They're, They're not living there. And so I think they're not experiencing justice like in our parable today. Maybe they're not experiencing mercy. Maybe they don't have enough resources for food, like the, the, the widow with the two mites. That was all she had. 
they're not living the kingdom of God experience. They're not experiencing what God's ultimate desire for us. And so there's this gap between what God desires, what the kingdom of God is like, and what people are experiencing. And into this gap, we are called to respond to that. Into the difference between what people are experiencing today and what God's ideal is, God's calling us as his hand and feet to step into those moments and to act. This is what compassion is. Is stepping into people's circumstances and lives because we have clarity, we have vision, we know what the kingdom of God is like. We know what God's intent was. And if you're not experiencing it, or there's somebody in in your world that's not experiencing it, you recognize that there's a gap, and you step in and see what you can do. You step in to be a part of this. There's a really wonderful charity out there called Compassion International. And I'm sure many of you have heard of Compassion International. It's, it's something that's brought up at Christian concerts or venues. And it's, a, it's a charity that connects people in a world that have plenty of resources. I mean, let's be honest. In, the, in our world, we have, we have tons of resources that other people don't have. It connects people like us with a world that doesn't have this. And Compassion International really focuses on children. Children through, through uh, like age 12 and on a young middle school. And what they do is they just connect us, the resource, people with the resources with the people that need them. And they focus on teaching. They get an education. They have adequate food. Even their family can benefit from, from the charity. Uh, and it's just as simple as a, a small token. Uh, uh, this thirty nine dollars a month, I think it's just it's on your credit card bill, and you just and, but you get a newsletter uh, every year, a couple times a year, and people then they're explaining to you how their lives are changed. So it's a, it's a really wonderful charity. But did you know how it started? It started by a man named Everett Swanson, and he was a pastor in Chicago, and. This was during the Korean War. Everett Swanson went to South Korea to minister to the troops that were there. And he became more and more burdened by the fact that he kept seeing all these uh, children that were orphans due to the war. And that, that they were, you know, they didn't have anything. They were on the streets and they just, they had nothing. And he became more and more burdened. Well, one cold morning, he woke up, and he was walking, uh, walking out on the street, and he saw the city workers out there picking up and throwing on the truck these, these rags, these piles of rags. And much to his horror, he went over and he realized those were orphans that were actually frozen overnight because they were in the street. And so he decided, man, I'm going to do something about this. He saw that, like, there's a gap here. I need to do something about this. And he started this charity, Compassion International, and 70 years later, 2.2 million children across 29 countries are being supported, whether they're orphans or just people without resources, are being supported because this one man had compassion. It's not called Empathy International. It's not called Sympathy International. It's called for us to act. And so this is the kind of compassion that God is calling us to. He's calling us to a world that needs us to step in and to take action on behalf of another person who's not experiencing the kingdom of God, who may never be experiencing it like like they should with justice and mercy and resources, but he's calling us to step into that. And maybe we're not going to be an Everett Swanson ourselves, but we can still do something This is how our faith is lived out in our world. This is what we are able to do. 
in order to meet the needs of the world around us. This is the kind of compassion that Jesus teaches us. I think we often engage in sympathy and empathy and confuse it for compassion. I think we feel for people. I think we may even be able to put ourselves in their shoes. But that's not what God's calling us to. He's calling us to action. Jesus delivered, he healed, he fed, he taught, so that people's needs were met and that we would know God's perspective. Jesus did those things for those people at that time, but he still has compassion on us. So there are a couple of simple but important ways that I think we can engage our compassion. Get it out of, get it into drive at least. We don't have to be flying down the highway yet, but get it out of neutral or park and get it into drive. The first I would say we need to thank God that he is all powerful, a complete identity, lacking nothing. And he had compassion on us. And by compassion, I'm talking an active compassion what he's doing in our lives. He's sowing into our lives. And so we need to understand that the first step of compassion is to realize that God has been compassionate to us. And he still is to this very day. Second thing I think we need to do is really truly and honestly assess the resources that we have available to us. We live in a world that tends to want people, tends to make you feel like you always need more, right? If you, uh, there's this great study out there that says, look, if you asked a person who made $30,000 a year, what would it take to like make a difference in their lives? A person making $30,000 a year would say $20,000. If I could just make $20,000, that would make another $20,000. I would, that would change my whole life. If you ask a person that makes $300,000, what would it take to make a significant change in your life? The person that makes $300,000 says, well, you know, $500,000. That would make such a huge difference in my life. And if you ask a person that makes a million dollars, a year. What would make a difference in your life? The person that has, makes a million dollars a year says, five million dollars would make all the difference in my life. This is a true, true story, true statistic. See, we come from this idea that we don't have enough. We're stuck in a mindset that says, uh, we just don't have enough yet. But guess what? As you get more you need even more. $20,000 isn't double. Uh, $300,000 uh, uh, to make six hundred dollars that is double. Five million versus a million. Do you see what, the, what we're trapped in our ideas in this world that we just don't have enough? We just need so much more. We need to look and have a real true sense of what our resources are that we have at our disposal. So maybe for you, it, you don't have a lot of money. Okay, I understand that. But maybe you have time. Maybe you're a wonderful administrator and you're just like, you can, you can put things together. Like you know how to organize and get stuff going. That's a, that's a skill and ability that, that can be used to work out and live out our compassion. See, people have, have needs to just connect with how they can be connected to compassion. Even the woman that gave her two mites, two copper pennies. She connected that, you know, God has resources. And what I have today, this is what I have today. So we have resources. We need to be honest about it. 
and be able to think about how can we use those resources for compassion. And thirdly, I think we need to join together as a church, actually schools, communities, uh, charities that are out there, workplaces. We have strength in number. There's a lot of us. And if you count the lot of us by the resources we actually do have available, we can, we can do some amazing things. We can change the world so that they understand and experience the kingdom of God like they're currently not. That's what God's calling us to do. God's calling us to, to gather together, to be a part, to let our faith be in action and to do something about the world. The, third, the fourth thing I think that's really important is when we start engaging, when we start doing it, we begin to see that what we're doing makes a difference. And so it's important that we get connected. It's important that we understand where can I pour in my resources and time? Because when you do, your compassion will grow because you see that what you're doing is making a difference. So as we're recipients of God's compassion towards us, I would invite you to understand, to recognize all that God's given you, and let's join together and have compassion on the world outside. Would you join me as we close in prayer? Lord, today we are so grateful, Lord, that we live as Christ followers with your compassion. Lord, we didn't deserve it, but Lord, you have shown compassion for us by living and doing and working and operating in our lives actively, even today. And Lord, we're thankful for that. Lord, help us to understand that all the gifts that you've given us are meant not just for us, but they're meant to be shown, show the world what compassion truly looks like. We're so grateful that we have the example of Christ to see your love in action. And Lord, that our faith can be in action and we can be active and moving. So Lord, today we thank you that you've called us to this calling. And Lord, whether it be here as our church or in our schools or workplaces or wherever it is, Lord, help us to be ambassadors of your compassion. To show people that we can do stuff together so much more than we can do alone. That we can make a change in the world. We thank you that you can change our, even our hearts. And as we see compassion, we can grow in compassion. Jesus, we just thank you and praise you for all these things, in your name, amen. Well, our worship team is going to lead us in our final song, and as they do, I would like to invite you to share with your tithes and your offerings, and please drop your connection cards in. You can also do it online. I do it online, uh, but uh, just stand and join us as we sing together. I just want to speak the name of Jesus.